Hi, everybody. It's uh, election season, Ryan. Yeah. First time voter, are you? Yeah. Uh, we got our special guest on the show today. Today, we grill him, Kau Kau. Let's do it. I mean, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Today's guest, I probably retweeted him on Twitter a lot, like a lot, like you know, because like you know, when when things when things get like heated up, you know, like yeah, I agree with this guy. Then you know, uh, you don't want to compose a tweet on your own and risk yourself getting into trouble, so you just retweet this guy. <laughs> but uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we have on the show, very happy to have him. We have Mr. Fami Fadil. Hello, welcome. Hey guys. Woo. So happy to be here. Do you get people coming up to you? Yo, what's up, Mr. Lumba Pantai? No, no, not at all. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that, should, that should how this how it should be, you know. I met Michelle Earl. I was like, Yo, what's up, Subang Jaya? You know, you know it reminds me of like Game of Thrones, <laughs> Lord of Lumba Pantai. Yes. <laughs> Lord Stark. Lord Stark. <laughs> w- w- welcome to the show. Uh, it's election season. Things are getting very interesting. Um, and uh, just to just to highlight that Mama sessions, right? We hardly talk about politics, but. I feel like the younger generation these days are a little bit more, like you know, well informed, you know, for their future well being. And oh, so, are they? Are they really that well? I don't know. Informed? You tell me, Ryan. You're the youngest here. I just, oh, I just <laughs> dated. Sorry for dating the both of us, <laughs> Fabi. But uh, <laughs> I feel sad. <laughs> uh, I feel it's hard to keep up uh, these days, especially with so many outlets. You know, back back then it used to just be newspaper, radio. You know, you can keep up what's going on, but now there's like. Twitter, there's Facebook, and you have to really think really hard what is real, what is not real, what is like like spread by some some auntie on WhatsApp that's that's probably like factually completely incorrect and, and it's a lot of digging and it's quite tiring uh, to be honest. I ask you one simple question and you answer a long winded answer. <laughs> yeah, <my> answer. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, uh, Fami, yeah, for the benefit of our listeners, you know, uh, who are just tuning in for the first time, you know, could you please introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Fami Fadil. I'm um, 41 years old. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer by training. Um, I used to be in the arts, a theatre performer, writer, director, uh, occasional actor, and I was the member of parliament for Lembah Pantai between 2018 and 10th of October, 2022. Now I'm seeking re-election. Uh, I w- I would like to extend my contract. That's that's <laughs> awesome. And if I'm a chemical engineer, and it goes yeah. one full circle. Not just chemical like, engineer. Yeah, it, like in the entertainment, so like in theatre, yeah. acting, writing, directing, and then into politics. How how did that come about? Well, uh, a lot of people say that you know there's there's a lot of acting in 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 politics. <laughs> I was about to t- <laughs> I was about to dwell into that, but he said it himself. Yeah. So a- a- <laughs> actually, before I, I got into politics, I had a lot of my friends in the arts who were like asking, "Fabi, are you sure you want to get into politics? It's really dirty." Uh huh. You know this, but then you know the arts world has its own politics. Yeah. You know, every organization, even you know your office, the studio has its own office politics. I so, like to think that we don't have any. Yeah. Otherwise, unless of course in, uh, behind my back, there's a lot Ooh, of things going on. Just, I'm just saying, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I see the intern is like, you know, wearing, my, wearing his mask and laughing behind the mask again. Like, mm. Tomorrow you see the intern checking into Sheraton already. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> Just so you know, I haven't signed your internship report yet. So, alamak. It's okay, enough, enough. Yes, yes, go Oof. on. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think I think my my interest in the arts and politics kind of coincide. You mm-hmm. know, um, I was born in 1981. So, for a very long time, I had only known one prime minister. Yeah. Mahathir, for, yeah. For, yeah. you know, longest time. And then 1997, 1998 happened and there was Reformasi and then Anwar Ibrahim was beaten up and he was sent to prison. Yeah. And my family lived, you know, kind of like a stone throws away from the Anwar uh, residence, the, the the household. Okay. And we would hear all these helicopters and, you know, like there's like a huge, you know, like people coming together at night and we're wondering what's going on. Mm-hmm. And my parents are civil servants. You know, my dad ran Felda. My mom was a PTD officer, mm-hmm. a Tadbir and diplomatic. And they n- they both know Anwar because they all went to University of Malaya. Yeah. So Reformasi was an eye opener for me because that was the first time in my young kind of that that at that age, 
like seeing tumult, seeing people on the streets of Kuala Lumpur fighting the police, police fighting back, people yep. getting beaten up, yep. getting arrested, getting tear gassed, seeing Tian Chua sitting in front of an FRU truck. Oh, yeah, I remember that, that picture. That's like, you know, and, and all of that is legendary. And um, I, I came of age in, in terms of like seeing what was happening in, in society because when I went to, to college, I went to Taylor's, not, near, not, not too far from where we are yeah. doing this recording. And I had a literature teacher um, who said, don't believe what you see on TV, what you hear on radio, what you read in the papers. Go out, see for yourself and decide for yourself yep. what is happening to this country. So at that time, you know, like the idea of agency, the idea of possessing or, or empowered, being empowered was, was the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah. But because there were so many things, it was so confusing and it was so, you know, my parents said, don't go out. But my friend said, yeah, come, come, let's go for that street, yeah, the street demo, you know, like, yeah, yeah, let's go. So the rebel in me, you know, being young and all, okay, yeah, let's go. Then, then uh, of course, slowly I, I saw all these things yeah. and then I wanted to express myself and that's how I got to do the arts. Mm -hmm. So I started writing poetry and in college we used to have uh, this every week there would be kind of like a gathering of friends and we would perform for each other, mm -hmm. our own original works. And that eventually evolved into... Um, this arts group that I was in. Right. Uh, and then we joined this arts collective called Five Arts Centre. And, and a lot of the work that I do as an, as an arts practitioner also had a political bent. It was, a lot of it is about human rights, right. mm. about freedom of expression, mm -hmm. about, you know, Malaysia. And that was kind of the, tra the, the trajectory. Eventually, uh, I had to go and, you know, study. My dad wouldn't, pay for me to go and study the arts. So it had to be something practical and something that theoretically can earn money. So basically, Asian parents lie. It's like, you know, you're not going to be an actor, no. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's no. either... Chicha is uh, accounts. Uh, no, no, if you, if you go into the art... Yeah. Yeah. Medical. <laughs> no, if you go in the art stream, right? Yeah, accountant. Yes, accountant. Uh, okay. Or science. So he, he went to the science stream and he went one circle arts, everything, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, did, I did chemical engineering really as a partly as an academic exercise to, to prove to my parents, to prove to myself that I can, if I apply myself, you know, if I, if I really do it, I can. I can okay. get it done. So um, out of all of the engineering, I, I, I remember there was, you know, like a day in, in, in college and, and, you know, people asking, okay, what, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. So the director of the program came out and started listing out all of these programs and this is what you earn, this is what you earn, this is what you do. And then I was like, okay, out of all of the engineering things, which is the one that I hate the least? <laughs> so <laughs> I, can't, I can't deal with wires. I, I, I can't see myself standing in the sun for civil. Uh, I am not that great with you know, metal parts, so mm -hmm. mechanical, no. Chemistry, you know, kind of kinda okay. So it was the least, the, the, the least evil in, in that right. sense for me. So I decided to do that. And, and um, you know, I, I did relatively well. Right. Um, but the interesting thing, so in Malaysia, I was, I came of age, I started seeing things because of Reformasi. When I went to the States, uh, it was a small campus town called uh, uh, Purdue. Uh, the university is called Purdue in, yeah. in West Lafayette, Indiana. So it was a campus town and all around it was just corn. So there's no, you know, like there was no real social life. So it was just <laughs> studying. I've, I've been to Purdue. He's not yeah. he's telling the truth. I'm, I'm yeah. telling the truth. It, it's so funny it's that really most Malaysians there. that always go to the States, okay, back, back, like in our era, yeah. I would like to say that we're from the same generation. Uh, yeah. So, like, well, like, so I had friends who went to the States too, but they will always go to this one Ulu place in the States. But the thing is just because it's the States, like, wow. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like my friend went to South Dakota. I was like, "Whoa, it sounds great!" And I, I saw pictures. It's like nothing. There. I was like, "Oh, there's no, only one Chinese but, restaurant." But to be <laughs> fair, town. Purdue is very popular because their engineering program is is top notch. South Co Dakota, Dakota as well. Yeah, yeah South yeah. Dakota as well. And when I was there, September 11 happened. Uh, oh. oh, you were in the states as was, it happened. Yeah, I was in the states, and and it was one of those again uh, world changing, life changing yeah. kind of experiences, and. But because I'm Malaysian, they couldn't fit me into any box. In that sense, mm. you know, like, okay, you're not Arab, you're not, you know, we don't entirely know, are you Latino, are you what? Yeah. You know? so, so it was fine. You know, there, there, was no, there was no, nothing bad that happened to me. But what was great was I got to see a lot of peace protests up yeah. close. Yeah. So I attended peace protest, protests on campus. Um, I went to various cities, including New York City. So there was I went I went to a peace protest in New York City in Times Square, 
um, during spring break. So people for spring break in the US would go to Cancun or would go to you know somewhere warm. My friend and I decided to go to New York yeah. <laughs> to join a peace protest against, I think it must have been like the start of the Afghan war, the Iraq war, one, yeah. of, the, one of the wars. Uh, yeah. Afghanistan, yeah. yeah, I remember. So, so, so that that was that was my life, you know, in a sense, and all of that, you know, at the same time that that I was in the states, oh, I would get involved in 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 arts in 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 ca- on campus, and eventually I came back. Yeah, uh, in t- two thousand and four, you know, like filled with gusto and filled with yeah, boleh buat yeah, yes. kita boleh berprotest dengan aman, and w- the first thing I went to was a. Uh, there was a peace protest in front of Bukit Aman. Yeah. <laughs> handing over a memorandum on uh, deaths in police custody. And I was there with a whole bunch of people. Some mm-hmm. of them ended up being ministers, you know, during Pakatan Harapan's uh, time uh, in power in uh, 2018. I, I like how you just went straight to Bukit Aman to protest. You didn't yeah. start somewhere like in the PJ, no. PJ Padang, you, you straight know. To HQ. <laughs> straight to HQ. Straight to HQ. You, yeah, my... my you you, you want to do something, do big. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was there all of like, you know, maybe 20, 20 years old and like, wow, yeah, come back. Yeah, we can change Malaysia. And this is months before the 2004 elections. And then I was arrested. So, <laughs> so I was arrested in front of Bukit Aman with a whole bunch of people. Like, um, and, and it was a peaceful, I mean, because elections were so close. Yeah. So they kind of let us go at the end of the day. And it was fine. Um, was it scary though when you when they came out and told you that okay you're about to be arrested for protesting? No, my my circumstance, uh, I how I got arrested was was quite interesting. Um, I had a camera with me, a, a handheld video camera, and I pretended to be a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Uh, school project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and they had at that time um, they had brought out from Bukit Aman uh, a water cannon. And, oh, oh and, my and God. the the leader of the group had come out and said, "We want to negotiate." <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then everyone ran helter skelter, and I was like, "Okay, I'm on the side. Like, okay, I'm gonna be safe because now there are people coming out from Bukit Aman, and they look like reporters." Yeah, they were all special branch. Oh. All special branch. oh, so I was mingling with special branch and walking around, and then I was filming some people getting arrested, and then a police officer turns turns around and looks at me and says, "You." You ingat ni kelaka ya? Tangkap dia! Oh my gosh, okay. But what, what, like, on what grounds did they arrest you for? They, they like, must have thought that I I thought of myself as being funny. No, but like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you I mean, arrest someone, yeah. you, you, that's a charge, right? Like, no, no, you're arrested, there was, no? No, no, no. Like, no do they, they, do they not need a reason to arrest at, you? At or it's like, I, I suka lah, then I tangkap. No, they didn't explain to me why I was arrested at, at that time. And, you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't ask. Uh, I was I was uh, dumbfounded. I think I was like, "Wow, what's going on? Mm. Wow, I'm arrested. My mom's gonna kill me." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not scared <laughs> of the cops, you know. You're scared of your parents. Wait, wait, go. What happened? Tadi, di Bukit Aman. Protest lah, bukan dalam Bukit Aman. You, exactly. You, because, because. Okay, here's the here's the here's the the greatest, the funniest thing. My mom. My my parents are civil servants. Yeah. So my mom was a PTD officer. Mm-hmm. Right? PTD is like, you know, Pegawai Tak Bir and Diplomatic. At, ah. that, at that time, at that time, my mom was the director general of the legal department in the Prime Minister's office. <laughs> <laughs> she was Ketua Pengarah Bahayu, Bahagian Halikwal Undang Undang, which looks after the police, looks after Attorney General's chambers, looks after prisons. She is the, the honorary secretary of the pardons, the pardons board. And she gets a call from her son oh, <laughs> that morning. Ma, ma, Fami kena tangkap. What? <laughs> Fami, you know it's a Saturday morning. You know, I I, I want to rest. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that she's in that department and all of a sudden it's like, yeah. Yeah, hey, yeah. What's, what's your son doing? Oh, he's testing, he's yeah. testing, he's testing. Yeah. He's testing. <laughs> so I was testing the system t- and, <laughs> and we were all brought to... Um, where Lala Port is now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they you know, like Pudu Jail, they used to have um they used to have a a, a, a police station in front, Hang Tua. This was this, wait, Pudu Jail wasn't operational already, right? No. Oh, no. yeah. I studied there. No, not in Pudu Jail, sorry. <laughs> there, there, I was, not, not, I was <laughs> say. In down down the road where there's one school there. Yeah, where did you learn all of this, you know, fancy studio thing? It must have been Pudu. <laughs> 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 oh man, it, it's funny that you mentioned about the whole reform RC and KL and stuff like that because uh, at, at that point that, that was happening, I was actually in school. Oh, and wow. the next day, uh, my mom said, "Okay, don't go to school." My mom's a civil servant as well, so she, but she doesn't teach in KL. 
But uh, funnily enough, when that happened, it, it basically was the first time where the young kids, I was, I think, Form 3 at that point in time, and we just finished uh, PMR trials or something like that. Lah. And then the teacher wanted to give us more tasks or whatever, didn't allow us to play PJK, and then all the whole entire class shouted reformacy in the <laughs> class. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I think that's when the younger generation was exposed to this type of, like, you know, opposing nature. This was nature. the huge protest. Yeah, yeah it was. Right. When, you know, Anwar I mean, was... I was really young, la, so I... Yeah. I, I you sure you were something... young or were you still swimming? <laughs> just 03, is it? Uh, no, no, this, this was, was in 98. two... 98. 98, yeah, 98. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, it's like, you, you watch the news and that Astro is really there. You see CNN and you have Anwar Ibrahim talking, uh, you know, in his house with a bunch of reporters all sitting on the floor because, you know, we're all Asian. And suddenly, like, a, a, a SWAT team, I can't remember, ISA? ISA team? Yeah. yeah. Is it called ISA? They right. just really storm into the house and everybody was like, oh, what's During going the, on? During like, the video. In yeah. The- <laughs> oh, yes, yes, it wow. was captured on CNN. Damn, and then when we wow. were watching it at home, we were like, oh, what's going on? Yeah. He isn't, and the thing is, to, in our brains, was like, isn't he the deputy prime minister? You know what I mean? It's suddenly, yeah. there's suddenly, it, there is this kind of, like, fear that Shh. people kind of talk to each other. Oh, you saw that, you saw that, you saw that. And that's it. You know? No, one thing I find crazy is that okay, this happened in what ninety eight, which yeah. is twenty over years ago. Yeah, yeah. twenty four years. Twenty four years. And this same ago. drama, right? This story, right? Yeah. Between this whole Anwar and Made, all this thing, is still happening now. You know, like it's been over twenty years, and like this feud, I would call, I would say, like like a feud kind of thing. Yeah, it's like you still feel the after effects of it. Yeah, because I I think I think when you talk about um you know, like politics and you talk about um, not dynasties, but but just the length of this, you know, okay, Game of Thrones is six, seven seasons. <laughs> we're, we're into our 24th season, right? <laughs> of the Malaysian Game of Thrones. It's still better than Game yeah. of Thrones, by the way, because like, the yeah. last season of Game of Thrones was horrible. Oh my God, what, what, <laughs> what was, ah. So, so yeah, so in, in a sense, you know, like uh, this this coming elections, is it the final season of, yeah. of the Malaysian Game of Thrones? I, I, well, that's that's the thing about politics, you know. There will always be kind of like new generation to take over, and then, um, you know, like, yeah. The, Who there though? It's yeah. been it's been how many years in Malaysia, and it's still well, the same generation. I mean, no, I think I think now now you have you know a lot of younger people. Yeah. Uh, well, there's Hadik who's like pretty young, and yeah. then there's Rafizi who's not that young, but still quite young when, yeah. you, when you compare. Um, like uh, like my party PKR. Mm-hmm. Um, we recently completed our party elections sometime in May, and I just did you know simple math. Like after Anwar and Saifuddin Nasution, the president and the secgen, yep. everybody else, almost everybody else, our average age is about forty two or forty three. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, which is pretty good. You've got Nurul Iza, Rafizi, Nick Nazmi, Chang Li Kang, myself, Akmal Nase. Amiruddin Shari, the Menteri Besar of Selangor. Yep. So our average age is about where, where that, that or is, forty lah. Yeah. Give or take. And this is this is the top level of the party. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're like the top decision makers of the party, in that sense. So there is change happening, and I think this election, you know, if if you've been watching the news, um, particularly when when uh, parties announce their candidates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, okay. Sure. You you've still got the Mahades, the Tunku Razali's. You know, like. This is, this is Tengku Razali's what, twelfth, thirteenth election or something like that. It's, mm-hmm. it's he's he's he's, a, he, he's perpetually there, but you're also seeing like some uh, familiar faces kind of retire. Yeah, you know, and and uh, it will it will happen. It it will take some time, because for a lot of people, um, it, it depends on the party culture. It depends on what happens. I think we're in. When a stage of Malaysian politics where there is a generational shift, it will take a little bit of time. Yeah. And GE14 started that process. And it's like that uh, uh, William, Butler, William Butler Yeats uh, poem, you know, um, the second coming and the, the center cannot hold anymore. Mm. So things are falling apart. Yep. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. But the idea is that when GE14 happened, that imagination, the mythology, the, the the myth, the idea that Barisan Nasional will always be in power yeah. was shattered. And as a result, the 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 hold on that monop- that that hegemony or monopoly, I mean big word, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but essentially it's 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 things you can't view them in the same way anymore. Do you think this is because of uh, how uh, the general public kind of consume entertainment these days with social media? Yep. Like, like, okay, like for example, GE14, we were all there. Can you imagine 
for us to find out the winning party, we had to rely on Malaysia Kini. A big up to Malaysia Kini, by the way. Um, they had they had a website. They had like a makeshift site that they have to put together. Yeah. Like maybe like yeah. two days. Yeah. And you I know they to, to update the 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 winnings. It was and like then, three in the morning or yeah, yeah, and, like and, and at that point in time, you were looking at mainstream media, which was polished and everything. Everybody wearing their suits. And then you have the like the underdogs, I mean, Leisha Kini and all the other things. And then when things started to shift, all of a sudden, because you know, I have colleagues in Astro, you see the people on TV change. What, what, and yeah, what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> And and uh, which which brings me to my to my next question actually like I I've been in the entertainment industry for about almost like 10, 15 years, uh, and I, I've been on mainstream and I now I'm very much like you know specialized on digital media and social media and I saw the limitations and the and the kind of things that you can or cannot say uh, on mainstream media. Do you think we'll ever get that freedom in Malaysia or? Or when you know, despite what party that governs, there will be some rules and regulations to make the party look good. I think. Well, I mean, look at it this way: when when Pakatan Harapan was in power, we never prosecuted people mm -hmm. for saying whatever they want to say, whether they were you know graphic artists like Fami Reza <laughs> or journalists who you know we we didn't do that. Yeah, and and it it really is because of our reformist credentials. We're like, no, 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 no. You can, you can say whatever you want. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, w you know, leaders or whoever. You know, we should be except for criminal defamation. Yeah. Right. So th you draw the line because it's in the penal code. It's yeah. there. But otherwise, if it's political, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. You know, you you fight ideas with ideas. You don't fight ideas with batons. You know, you and or, or handcuffs. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's not the way. Anyway, you can't you can't do anything. I remember the most legendary thing that happened that night was Karim Raslan ranting. If you remember Karim Raslan, mm -hmm. oh um, yes, yes, yes. And and he was just going on, and it was the most amazing, amazing face you know like face meltdown kind of meltdowning kind of thing mm -hmm. for uh, the administration at that time. The, the election commission was yeah, it? Yeah, he was he, he was on just that. berating the election commission, and and you know you can see that happen. Of course, the the secretary of the election commission at that time also happens to be the chairman of the election commission now. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's see how it goes. Um, I think we have cause for concern among mm -hmm. among political parties and and candidates, but we are we are approaching this election with um, you know good faith in good faith. Yeah. Uh, but in today's day and age, because there is no longer an idea of a mainstream single channel. You know, like one-way communication. Everything mm. it's it's so splintered, it's so fractured and fragmented. Yeah, that somehow, some way, a truth will get out. Yeah, you can't stop that anymore. It's like Pandora's box has been opened because mm. of Meta, because of Twitter, TikTok, etc. Yeah, right? and and you can't. You can try to suppress it. You can try to hold it in, but it will. The truth will be out. I feel like with social media these days, when the truth goes out, um, like you know, everybody would just flood with confusion, so that people did, did, would not know like. Which article to believe? I think on election night in uh, on the nineteenth of November, yeah, uh, there there could possibly be a lot of potentially a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is where fact checking. This is where kalau tak pasti jangan kongsi. Yeah, if if if, if you if you, if you if you're not sure, don't retweet. Mm -hmm. You know, don't share. Um, do a little bit of fact check. Um, and some of it, you know, of course, netizens, people online, you know, we're, we're quite quick. To be our own, you know, detective Conan kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. and go and investigate. So mm. someone, someone was sharing how, you know, there was this, there was this. Uh, I, I'm not sure when this is airing, but um, like a, f a couple of days after the BN uh, announcement of its candidates, there was a, a, a photo that was circulating on social media saying, "This is the Akujanji. This is the promise." Yeah, that, yeah. That uh, candidates have to sign, and some of the things that it said in there is, is quite interesting. Yeah. So people were saying like, okay. BN has come out and said it's it's false, but people pointed out like, hey, look at the corner of that picture. You can see a PWTC tissue, uh, paper, tissue paper that is very detailed oh, and stuff like that. And then you look at the table, the grain, and then it matches with the grain and the table in in some what? of the other public pictures. This is some Sherlock Holmes shit. It's like, like some, yeah, but it's yes, I heard that. But it's like it's like every man, you know, kind of like a, a, a kind of CS, CSI. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is. Yeah, I mean, you want to believe. If you want to believe, go ahead, right? Yeah. If you don't want to believe, also go ahead. It's mm -hmm. it's fine. Um, I think at the same time, be wary of confirmation bias. Mm. Just because you want to believe it to be true, 
be be careful. Right. So some people were circulating this this uh, video uh, supposedly of uh, Muhammad Hassan, the mm-hmm. UMNO deputy president. Yes. Uh, supposedly standing in front of a crowd saying, "Ganyang kedai kopi, go and go out and turn over the tables of those who are spreading lies about the government." And then you know people. I had some of my friends in in, in politics come out and say, "Oh, Pakatan Harapan must come out strongly against Muhammad Hassan on this statement." Mm-hmm. And then I took a beat. I took a knee and just like okay let's process this let's think this through did this happen just now mm-hmm. and then I I took a closer look at this picture I kind of did a quick google uh, search and then I realized that it's actually a sta- uh, uh, a speech that Mahasan gave in 2018 ah. oh. and the tell the tell was actually the person standing next to him was Kairi Jamaluddin right sporting a 2018 haircut <laughs> <laughs> So it's not not the not the <laughs> not the jambang not, uh, not, not the jambang that he has right now. <laughs> not the COVID stress case. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, okay. I, I, there's a lot of questions I want to ask, but you know I think I want to get straight into it. But before we get into the questions, like look, I, I I've been to some of the dramas, uh, both BN and also uh, PKR and also DAP Pakatan Harapan throughout the years. As a kid, I truly truly go. But after I was an adult, I just went on myself. When I, when my mom, and um. And my wife, it's quite fun, like actually, sometimes to go outside things to see how they all like you know talk. Sometimes it can be quite inspiring and stuff. Now, like uh, for the past two Cheramas I went before this, they were always talking about okay, Manto Kanto, petrol uh, will lower the petrol prices, and then like I'm not sure where I read on Twitter. It could be I could be fact checking wrong, but like you know they were bringing up the whole idea of like okay, you know we're gonna Manto Kanto again, and maybe bring down the petrol prices. Do you think people still care about this, or do they just want right now people like for me? Um, I look at it. I may sound a little bit privileged to say something like this or comment on this. Say, okay, you know what? I don't care about the petrol prices. I don't care about the tolls. I just want stability in my whole country, and I want great education for my children because it feel I, I feel like I am forced to pay a premium for my kids to get better education to be competitive worldwide. Uh, I think it's not either or. I think it's all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, if you want to get any of these things fixed, the first Basic thing is you need good governance, and to have better, better governance, the best governance, you need to eradicate corruption. Yes. So corrupt practices destroys everything, all the best laid plans, because it increases the cost of doing business, it increases the cost of running projects, and things don't get done, like ships that stay in the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you pay six billion, but none of the six ships have arrived, this kind of thing. So, the root. The root issue is corruption. Right. Getting rid of corruption. Secondly, it's about a plan. So it's not just about you know like um, um, uh, repealing or or, or or getting rid of tolls. It's about cost of living issues, right? So toll is one of the manifestation of what what we can address if we are in government. Right. Uh, so there are about four or five things essentially. It's about cost of living. It's about education. It's about yes. better pay. It's about housing. It's about public transport. Mm-hmm. You know, and and also obviously it's about the environment, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, Pakatan Harapan uh, on the second of November released uh, our manifesto, yeah. our action plan for GE15, and there are ten ten key things that we we want to focus on. So none of the ke- the, the ke- ten key things. It's more like um, the overarching themes, but underpinning all of that is good governance and eradication of corruption. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, everywhere I go, I tell the story because it's just so, it's just so unbelievable. One time, um, twice actually, this this Amno warlord, mm-hmm. um, when I when I met with him, he's 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 a huge businessman, and um, he told me that uh, life as a businessman under Pakatan Harapan was so much better mm-hmm. as a businessman. <laughs> Because there was so little corruption. <laughs> okay, and this comes and from an Amlo warlord. Yeah. Oh. And and the first time I heard it, I was like, "Uncle, are you for real? Oh, mm-hmm. are you telling me that it was better?" <laughs> <laughs> because when I when I met him, it was uh, Mujidin who was okay. in power. And then recently, I met him again, mm-hmm. and then he said the same thing. <laughs> he said, "You know, you know, whatever it is, it was as a businessman, life was so much better under PH." Okay. So I was like, "Wow, okay," and and I can believe that because. You know, you've got you've got Anthony Lok, the minister of finance, uh, the minister of uh, transport at that time, mm-hmm. receiving. What did he receive? It wasn't bags of cash. It was like two handphones on on a stage, and he gave it back. Mm-hmm. He said, "As a minister, I can't receive this." And a lot of my colleagues who have remained with Pakatan Harapan said that when Mahade was prime minister, his admonishment he he told off ministers against he he, he warned ministers against owning shares. Right. 
as as ministers mm. because it would be it would be wrong. You have inside yeah. information, and so so he told them off, and even and 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 it spread, you know, because that that Amno Warlord told me people did not dare to ask for bribes. You know, mm-hmm. civil servants or, or various people mm-hmm. didn't ask for bribes. I never practiced it. I mean, obviously. And there was one time I was asked when when I was an MP supporting the government yep. uh, when PH was in power. I had to. Uh, I was invited to launch uh, an art exhibition in Tamanton, and as a, as a gift, they they wanted to give me a, a very expensive painting. Oh, okay. Worth a couple of thousand ringgit, and then I said, no, I can't. I can't receive this. You okay. Know? Instead, if you want to auction it and give that money to charity. Okay. So it's about I think an ethos. It's about, you know, a philosophy. It's about a way that we look at public life. Mm-hmm. And people sometimes they 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 kind of make fun of Anwar. Recently he in in Ipo he announced that if he were to become prime minister, he won't take the PM's pay. And people might say, "Ah, you know what? So what?" It's mm-hmm. like it's not about that. It's not just about not taking a pay. Uh in the last year, between 13th of September and 10th of October 2020, 13th of September 2021 and 10th of October 2022, mm-hmm. Anwar Ibrahim, as opposition leader, was eligible to receive 50,000 ringgit a month okay. as additional allowances, befitting his status as an equivalent of a minister mm-hmm. in our MOU. I see. But he refused. The reason was, he said, it is unconscionable for me to receive this when people are suffering, mm-hmm. whether it's because mm. of the floods, people are losing jobs, people are, you know, they have so much arrears. So it's about a mindset, it's about a mentality, it's about a frame of mind, it's a, a way of thinking. I mean, it's it's a worldview. Right? Yeah. So a lot of the leaders that have remained in PH right now, these are the ones who've been tested by fire. These are the ones who have, you know, have been solicited, have been enticed, have been lured, have been pressured. And they have remained in this fight. And I am proud to stand with them. And I believe it's not about, like, like, like what I said, it's about if you want a better Malaysia, it has to start with the leadership. And yeah. it's got, we've, we've got to stop that kind of bad culture from permeating the rest of society. So basically, I mean, you, you, I mean it's just like a company that's not go so big as in the leader of a country. Like even the company, you need good leaders to basically transcend their beliefs and practices down in their staffs and everybody would just follow. I think it starts from the top. Uh, yeah, like it does. Said, you know, Let just uh, some comparison, like, okay, let's be real. Uh, we all know like, like bribery is, is a big problem here in Malaysia, not just at the top level. Not, not, not bribery, it, corruption. Corrup- corruption, yeah. I like say, I'm talking about even like, like police, you know, you hear stories of, of just you go and pay the police officer off. We have to say allegedly. Police. Allegedly, yeah. Here's yeah, okay. story, yeah. Story, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I hear the same stories in Singapore. You try to do that, they slap you with another fine of bribery. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, because from the top down, they tr- straight stamp see, it out. See, the, the thing about, and, and, and you're right, actually it's about setting a good example and having a, a, a leader who is not afraid to, to make it known that he or she does not want this culture there. Mm-hmm. I remember when... when um, Hamid Bador uh, was the IGP. Uh, I went for a courtesy visit, a courtesy call, and in Bukit Aman, and I met with him and all of his senior officers. He was the IGP at that time. Mm-hmm. And in front of me, it, with all of these officers there, he said he will not tolerate corruption in the police force. Right. So that sends a very clear signal that he will not tolerate corruption. And we saw at the end of his tenure how he also had a Karim Raslan-esque, you know, kind of like a face melting kind of diatribe <laughs> har- harangue you know kind of like yeah all this corruption i know i, I like how karim rasan is now a label <laughs> yeah <laughs> doing you know, the karim do, do, do a karim rasan kind of thing right but it's like what they say you know f- fish rots from the head right yeah so you got to stop the rot from the head and the thing that i realized with with corrupt with corruption and corrupt practices is that if you're in an office yeah and you know somebody does it and if you speak up, if you want to remain in that office, you've got to make sure you don't get kicked out. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes people are afraid. If I speak out, then other people are going to turn on me because yeah. everyone's going to say, why are you stopping the gravy train? Mm-hmm. Why are you not in? Why are you like not one with the cool kids? Oh, you are so pambaris. Mm. Oh, you're so... And then you're going to tite. And then yeah. you're dead, right? But if you have a leader, the boss, the CEO, you know, the group, you know, whatever, right? And, and, and setting... And showing, you know, it's not about saying, it's about showing, right? So that's why, for example, as an MP, um, 
in in 2018, I before becoming a candidate, I declared my assets. Right. At that time, I had um, my assets, everything all in was about a million ringgit. Mm-hmm. Um, a house, a, two cars, um, some ASB, this kind of thing. Uh, a lot of debt at that time. Uh, but even now, um, today, um, before becoming, before receiving my watika, uh, I had to declare my assets. Right. So today, as we're doing this recording, it's the 3rd of November. Yesterday, Rafizi Ramli announced that he also has declared his assets. Yeah, so made headlines because 18 million. 18 million, man. <laughs> 18 million ringgit, man. 800 in depth. I'm like, okay, not bad. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I, I, I did my, uh, I crunched my numbers as well. So, I have in the la- in the last four years accrued an additional two hundred thousand ringgit. Yep. So I'm now worth one point two million. Mm-hmm. So so you know people can see. So asset declaration is not just about that moment in time. Mm-hmm. You've got to you've got to look at you know okay when when this person came in when this person left, you know and then fact check it against how they live their lives. Yeah. So I I am the shoes that you see me wearing are the same shoes that I wore for the campaign in twenty eighteen. The watch that you see me wearing is the same watch that I wore in 2018. <laughs> I'm like, you know, uh, maybe I'm not so much of a materialistic guy, but that's not the point. But I think if you, the problem with that is, right, next time someone see a picture, they can't tell whether it's the 2018 drama or the 2022 yeah. drama. <laughs> they can see my, they, they can see the hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Used, my hair used to be more black. <laughs> I, I I know that like sometimes these are being pinpointed on, on, on certain leaders that uh, live luxurious lifestyles, the clothes they wear and the watches they wear and stuff like that. But like, you know, do we re- like, okay, just, I want to ask, if that person is doing a great job for the country, it's like, does that even matter? Are they doing a great job? Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, if 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 they are, we wouldn't we wouldn't be having this conversation today. We, we, we. Now, uh, I think like in in in, Har- in, in Harapan's GE fifty mani- uh, manifesto, uh, you talked about uh, corruption, and you talking uh, you talked about uh, having a, or implementing an ombudsman system as one of the actions to be taken combat of the issue. So, establishing an ombudsman system to address issues misconduct by politicians and civil servants, including the enforcement authorities. Can you clear to elaborate on this a little bit and be honest, how long can something like this kind of revamp the entire system to make sure that it's clear? Because you see, some people always say this, you know, when they talk about corruptions, right? The layman people, the, 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 the mamat sessions and the conversations in the restaurants, are like, yeah, corruption is everywhere, one it's just how bad. You see, everybody in Malaysia, people already have this mentality. It's like, you think Singapore, no corruption, no? sure got one, just how bad anima, you know, that it's, it becomes a conversational matter and people kind of brush it off. So what, what, what's your comment on that? Well, let's take a look at smoking, for example. Smoking mm-hmm. in public places. Uh, at one point, it was impossible to imagine that, you know, we would not, we, we would, we would you know, uh, n- not see a time when people would like, psh, poo-poo people smoking in public now. Yeah. Right? So that happened because Pakatan Harapan at that time had the political will to say, stop. I, I, by the way, I love that, by the way. Because everywhere we go yeah. today, we, yeah, we, no, yeah. No, mama, oh, no more, no more smoking. You yeah. don't realize it as a normal yeah. individual until you have kids. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, people were, it, it was divided in the house, actually. Mm-hmm. I, I remember this discussion, partly because at that time, parliament had its own smoking room. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people used to be like, hey, come on, lie, it's parliament, right? No, 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 no. That, you know, so Dr. Zul, at that time, as Minister of Health, he gave an instruction, which then created some uproar. And he said, go and, Go and summon anyone who is uh, smoking. smoking, smoking there, and then there was a jurisdiction kind of issue because in the house I- I- on parliament grounds, um, it's the it's the legislative arm, so okay. the executive have no real power there, you know, uh, except with the with the uh, upper agreement of the the speaker, for example. Uh, but the point is, we change something after after BN and PN after PN and then subsequently BN came back into power. Um, if, if you've ever been to parliament, uh, there's, there's the house and then we have uh, a cafeteria and then we have some offices. And one of the offices near uh, the entrance that I used to go in and out from is called the chief whip's office. Mm-hmm. The chief whip is the chief disciplinarian of the party, but it's for the government side. Right. And when we were, uh, in, in, uh, when we were in, in government, it was a Spartan space, mm-hmm. like you know, we wouldn't have anything happening there. When uh, PN and BN got into power, it was effectively a cigar room. Oh. oh wow. It was, you know, where they would serve lobster and 
you know, really expensive fish. One time, I remember stopping in because I had to go and look for the Prime Minister and he was there. Mm -hmm. And they were serving me this fish that they said was really rare. And I'm like, are you guys for real? Mm. Like, what planet are you guys living on? You know, it's, it's, it's the height of the pandemic, sort of. And this, this is what you do behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. I can say this now. And many of those who were there are no longer candidates <laughs> because of a of, of a what I call uh, when when BN announced their their list of candidates it was mm -hmm. panchung berjemaah <laughs> you know? satu one 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 it was like a felling of uh, uh, Cleans, uh, cleansing uh, cleansing you know? cleansing <laughs> the cleanse the cleanse yeah, uh, yeah. The but not 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 uh, kind of like a col colonic kind of thing but <laughs> also I I dare say it could be the same thing. <laughs> But that goes to show a lot of the things that we started to do, which is good for the public, which yeah. is, you know, people you know, quite popular, they roll back on. Okay. Right? Because that, crin, you know, maybe maybe it ate into their lifestyle, they like that kind of thing. So just like on the issue of smoking, when it comes to corruption, when it comes to ombudsman, when it comes to, you know, making sure that uh, there's no abuse of power, mm -hmm. it, it must, we must have some firm action taken right. by the executive and those who lead the executive must be um, the the paragons of that that virtue. They must be the examples, right? So it starts with that. So I think it can be done. It will take time, and it, you know, the civil service plays an imp an exceptionally important role. The doctors and and the health uh, uh, people in in the health ministry were more than willing to participate in, in, in that kind of like stopping people from smoking kind of campaign. Mm -hmm. So if we have the buy-in of the civil service yeah, on this, then, then I think we can get it done. Now, uh, Syed Sadiq mentioned that like uh, in terms of our country, when the pandemic hit and education or whatever, in, in infrastructure and everything, he kind of said that we're almost like three to five years behind. For the lack of a better comparison, let's talk about our neighbours. We're just completely next door, Singapore, you know? And why do you think this happened when at one point of time, Malaysia was basically regarded as well, the roaring tiger of uh, Southeast Asia? What went wrong and what happened in your opinion? Yeah, uh, I think the, the golden years would be the 90s. Yes. Right? And um, some people say, okay, you know, Anwar was the Minister of Finance at that time. And there were also, um, I think those were, the, yeah, those were the great years, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, of course, then we had the Asian financial crisis. Our our ringgit took a beating, yeah. and then we had essentially almost twenty four years of political instability. Mm -hmm. And th there's this very interesting thing said by this um, blogger named Hishamuddin Rais. He is a legendary figure in the kind of like social activism circles. Uh, he used to, you know, part, be part of University of Malaya's uh, student activism movement, and he ran away. He was a you know, lifelong avowed Marxist. Uh, but he, he said, Satu dosa besar, Dr. Mahathir kepada Bani Melayu ialah menafikan uh, umat Melayu kepimpinan sejumlah pemimpin agung, pemimpin mm. yang besar. So one of the greatest pitfalls of Mahathir was denying the Malay uh, community, uh, the Malay peoples as it were, the leadership of these men, Tengku Razali, Musa Hitam, Gaffa Baba, Anwar Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. So if if the process that Dr. Mahathir did to kind of resolve internal tensions within his own party, AMNO at that time, I don't know whether everything that we've experienced over the last 24 years would be the same. Mm -hmm. Because it's about political order. Right. Essentially, the question that, that we are trying to answer in GE14 and now we have to answer again is a political reordering of our times. The, the old order of things, the old way of doing things ha is, is no longer applicable. Mm. Last time, okay, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in GE13 and GE14, 2013, mm -hmm. 2018, a month before dissolution of parliament, anywhere you go in Klang Valley, you would see like a sea of BN flags. Ah, yeah. yeah. Right, a sea of BN flags. Gee, yeah, now that you mention it. And and today, when we're recording this, it's the 3rd of November, and it's three weeks, three and a half weeks since dissolution of parliament, and you barely see any BN flags. Yeah, it, you, you're absolutely right, right. That, yeah. I just the, remember all the blue flags down the side of the road. Immediately, yeah, the, like immediately, yeah, immediately yeah. almost you, immediately. It's like, bang, it's in your face. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, then you come to realize what coincided with that time. One MDB. All oh, right. 
right? So a lot of the way that we were we were practicing politics, party party politics and electoral politics at that time, actually a lot of it was financed by one MDB, mm -hmm. especially in in certain political parties. Oh, okay. <laughs> How? What? It? Uh -huh. so what? What MDB was the biggest pivotal moment for? I think like uh, the th I would say it twenty the thirteenth and the fourteenth general elections. In my honest opinion, I think like in the thirteenth, all of us like oh okay cool yeah uh, one MDB. Then after that, it you guys took four years to really educate the public. Because uh, how big this thing actually is. Yeah, right? it's it's yeah. a really complicated thing. I yeah. mean, like I don't understand it. I mean, I I don't understand how the money went, where, how, where how do came, you like, yeah. how how do you bluff to be this organization when it sounds almost the same except one one word different. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Jolo yeah. is like wow, the 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 mother of all scammers or the father of all scammers, whatever it was. But the the point is the point is the the way that p political parties have been running the business of electoral politics has to change. And and what we're seeing right now is going to be a question of what what is the way that Malaysian politics should be run yep. going, for, going forward. What is a sustainable way? What is a sustainable model? Uh, is it that, that um, uh, you know, like ap ap apocryphally, okay? It means like by, by what people tell me and stuff mm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes... Uh, even though officially we are allowed to 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 use two hundred thousand ringgit yeah. in, in the elections, yeah, according to the law, I don't think so. Everybody <laughs> uses two hundred thousand ringgit. I don't think so, right? Yeah, I, I used because that's that's all I could raise last time around. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you see like people with with huge billboards and many 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 billboards and then like ad spaces and who's paying for all of this and, and Gangnam style. I remember in so Penang. Yes, uh. that's right. Right. So so a lot of that has to change uh, and and and. Also, there's a question: Who should represent which community? Is that even a question that we need to answer now, right? Because, and that's why that's why for me, of all of the political parties, um, apart from DAP, I mean, I'm closest to PKR. Yeah, a lot of that has to do with my my awakening, my political awakening that I said earlier. But it's also because you know, it, it just it's, it just it just feels. I mean, this this party feels right for me. Um, but it's about um, we need to not only move Malaysia in a different direction, we need to move Malaysian politics in a different direction. Yeah. It's got to be about ideas, it's got to be about debates. It's got to be about maturity, to be honest. Debating is, should be our culture, yeah. contrary to what some caretaker prime ministers could say. You know, debat itu budaya kita. Yeah. yeah. Although some people say, <laughs> Debat bukan budaya kita, budaya kita budaya rasuah. No, I don't, I don't think so. I disagree oh. with that. I disagree with that. Okay. Uh, Ryan was talking to me about this uh, earlier on, just before uh, we, we walked in, and I think he was mentioning about how he as an individual realizes that I think all the candidates were just uh, announced. I mean... And, yeah, uh, so I'm just curious. Like, like I mentioned, I'm a first-time voter. I only recently like got really studying into politics and everything. And when you guys like challenge for constituencies, right? What are the factors that you guys take into account? Like, cause in the end, I I don't know. It's just a right yet lah. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I feel like maybe the the people who are representing me in parliament do not actually care about the people they're actually representing. Mm. You get what I mean? You do get this feeling. Like, I do see some of them out there. Uh, they're actually really uh, out in their communities and doing good. But some I just don't really feel like they feel responsible for this large groups of people and let's be real, some constituencies are about like 100 over 1,000, 200,000 millions of people yeah. big, you know? So yeah. like, how, how does this whole thing take place in, or, or like, how do you how, guys do it? At your how party? do we choose our candidates, you mean? Yeah, yeah. And not just choose your candidates, like, how do you place them uh, uh, to right. the different constituencies, you know? Like, how do you know this guy is the right fit right. for this place? Like, he will actually help the people there. Yeah. Um, there are some things that I, <laughs> I'm not in the candidate selection process, the, the committee that, that sets it. Every party has its own way of choosing. Sometimes it's about, you know, like if you look at the states, uh, they're going to have their elections soon on the 8th of November mm. in the US. And they have a process of primaries. So they have a yeah. primary system. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, even the way the UK chooses within the party, chooses its prime minister, Rishi Sunak, for example, right? Yeah. Most recently. Uh, there, is a, there is a particular way that they, they've done it. Um, but for us, a lot of political parties, you either become a division chief of that 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 particular constituency, the 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 party, uh, the branch or division in that in that constituency, or the party feels that you have a certain skill set that is necessary to be brought to parliament. 
uh, or you have a, a, a particular skill or particular aptitude that fits that constituency. Mm. In my case, um, I started helping out in Lembah Pantai mm-hmm. in 1999. So in 99, I mean, I was I was 18 years old. I was in college. Who, who was your mentor then? Um, I didn't really have a mentor. It was more like, you know, reformasi, and then you 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 were filled with the, yeah the sense of life and yeah. fight and rebel. <laughs> you know, like we are the rebel alliance going okay. up against, you know, the evil empire, right? That kind of thing, and. And um, I was helping out. I was putting up posters. I was um, giving out leaflets, attending ceramas, and like wondering, wow, is this what elections is all about? Mm-hmm. Um, and and then twenty years later, actually, from putting up posters, becoming, you know, getting myself into the poster. Mm-hmm. So so that to me was a was a was an interesting, you know, the the the, the circle is complete kind of thing. Yeah. So if in your in your case, you, you know, it doesn't. You're not just like cherry picked out of nowhere and put into lumba pantai you, you kind of worked your way up to be kind of a lumba pantai boy la. yeah yes, kind of la. La. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so i've been helping there but the person who brought me into the party was durul iza ah oh, mm, okay right so um when she won 2008 was 2008 was our you know like um, what i would call our our um, that 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 kind of uh, that moment of of that that thawing of you know the 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 tundra that 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 glacier uh, of of politics. That was the start of the rays of sunshine. You know, okay, we took over Selangor, we took over Penang, and then there were also like um, Pera, but yeah. Pera quickly was turned around. But in Selangor and uh, KL, I I remember um, in 2008, I was actually not helping out Lima Pantai. Uh, I did go to Nurul Iza's nomination. Um, uh, I gathered with them uh, for nomination day, but I was helping out Sivarasa Rasya in Sungai Buloh. Mm-hmm. At that time, it was known as Subang. And on election night, um, I remember there was a sense of Siva, are you going to lose again? Because, <laughs> no. because he had contested oh, no. 99, lost 2004, lost, yep. and then 2008. And in 2008, I was it at his operation center holding a megaphone, <laughs> a hailer. And I was tasked with reading out results. That usually is the bearer of bad news, lah. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay. I, I don't think know. you posted a picture about this before. I did. I did. Yes. <laughs> I saw. I saw yes. that. <laughs> and, and it was like one of those moments that is so surreal. I remember it to today because I was reading like, uh, okay, this school we won, this stream we won, that area we won. Hey guys, something is something is happening. Mm-hmm. Siva, I I think you're gonna win. Mm-hmm. You know, it kept on going and going and going, and then. We won! It, it, it was the most like amazing moment. I remember in, in the early days of 2008, you know, more than 14 years ago, like that sense of euphoria, the sense of, you know, whether it's glasnost or parastroika, like in, in, in Russia, <laughs> you know, like uh, at the, during uh, um, the, the Russian communist regime kind of collapsing slowly. We started seeing that. And change takes a long time. Change is... It is a lifetime effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a dear friend of mine, her name is Marion De Cruz. She's a dancer, choreographer, and one of my mentors, really, in terms of you know setting my life, you know, in a on the straight and narrow. Uh, I remember when when um, you know she said to to bring change, you have to keep chipping away at that block. It won't mm. come today. It won't come next week. It won't come next month or next year. But you keep chipping, and the block will fall. And Ninety nine, we fought and we failed. Two thousand four, we fought and we failed. Two thousand and eight, we brought in Nurul Iza to Lembah Pantai, mm-hmm. and she defeated Sharizat. Yeah. And twenty thirteen, Nurul Iza defeated Rajanongchi, also mm-hmm. another giant. So, in choosing candidates, sometimes it's a stroke of luck. Mm. Sometimes it's a story of that constituency. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a story about the country. Right. Bringing Rafizi back to Pandan because in twenty thirteen. He fought and he won in Pandan. And then 2018, he set out that election because he did not want to be a liability to the party. Right. Uh, if he won and we didn't win overall, then the court cases would affect him. Yeah. I mean, we can say the same about a lot of cases happening yeah. now. 
but Rafizi took a personal he he took a personal decision. Yeah. And and as a result, one He went to jail for a while, I think. Did they? Um he he was he was um He he was the he was known as the architect that basically formulated not formulated but kind of like brought the whole one MDB thing to like One MDB. Yeah. Uh, NFC, yes. the, the cows in the condos kind of kind of issue. Oh, the cows and the condos. I almost <laughs> yeah. forgot about the cows yeah. and the condos. Uh, that happened in Lebah Pantai, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 yeah, and 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 that's the thing about I think where we are today as a as as a civilization, human humans, right? Yep. That sometimes because of social media, our attention span is the next three seconds, is the next yeah. five yeah. seconds. But we forget that there have been people. We stand on the shoulder of giants and. It's never from point zero. There's always a backstory. So you know, okay, Game of Thrones. You have the House of Dragons. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I like all these references to yeah, just. But it's, it's yeah. actually so relatable. It, it is. To yeah. Some extent. I mean, yeah. 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 Okay. Um. What, what is your What is your prediction for G15? Okay. You know, before we get there, uh, maybe we should. Wait. I got. I got. I got. I got one. I want to ask you. So a big, a big, big difference this time around. G15, first time ever in history of Malaysia, eighteen year olds. Are coming out to vote. Yeah, these are a whole new demographic that has never been considered before in in terms of voters. I'm not in terms of like welfare or like citizen welfare or whatnot. In terms of voters, this is a whole new demographic, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it's a huge amount of them. They say that the the, One of the, the biggest, under eighteen right? and the millennials kind of make up the make up the majority, majority of the voting voting. How how do you think this new change? How how do you think it's gonna affect G15 this time around? It's it's going to be a, a wild card, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, because eighteen year olds to thirty nine, eighteen to thirty nine year olds make up uh, a bit more than fifty percent. Oh wow! Of the voters now, and this is a huge, huge uh, effect. So, you generally would imagine that uh, first time voters. Um, the the way I think about uh, electoral politics now and that contest is is a little bit like. Uh, you know, uh, popularity of brands of mm. consumer goods yeah. to some extent. I mean, that's the easiest way of, of yeah. explaining it. Fami Reza, you know, I, I I like how he explains things. <laughs> he, he he's a great, you know, he, he's a dear old friend. Um, I've known him actually. Fami Reza, when we talk about Bukit Aman, the first person to get arrested that day was Fami Reza. <laughs> I, I so, think this guy actually has a bedroom in Bukit Aman. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. he gets arrested there. <laughs> Okay, but, Fami, back to your room. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got okay, a KPI okay. every yeah, year. Yeah, so oh, I'm like, not visited Bukit Aman this yeah. month. Okay, all right, time to do something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he gets an SMS. Okay, guys, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and um, I mean, he he puts it as you know, oh, you know, politicians, you know, it's it's like between Coke and Pepsi kind of thing, right? I, there's some truth to that, uh, in in the sense that you know, um, you 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 look for something that's relatable to you. You took mm. you you look for someone to represent you that you feel. Carries your values that kind of looks like you, maybe that that you feel can fight for you, or but at the same time, sometimes how people decide is so unfathomable. You you can't you can't guess. It is beyond algorithms and beyond uh, academic theory. Mm. Uh, there was a time. Um, th- there there's one time I met a, a voter who 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 voted in GE14. He said. You know, YB, I was standing in line and I was going to vote for Rajinong Chi, BN. And then you walked across and you saw me and you smiled at me and shook my hand. And then I said, I'm going to vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there was this lady once, she told me in 2013, um, she was waiting in line in, in Lembah Pantai going to vote. And she said she was, she stood in line waiting to vote for uh, at that time, Rajinong Chi again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at that time, and she was going to vote for BN, and then the person in front of her was talking to somebody else in front, and said Nurul Iza, you know, oh oh, she went to Asunta, and then this auntie said Asunta, I'm oh going to God. vote for Nurul Iza. <laughs> <laughs> so, what the wow, so, Asunta. Yeah, wow. No, so w- the the point is, there is no. Not to say there's no point, but sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. Mm. Sometimes you never know la, what it could be the 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 flimsiest of things, it could be the slightest of things, it could be I like blue, I don't like red, I like red, I don't like kind blue of, kind but, of thing. But it, it, it also goes to show this is this is what we we generally call the wisdom of the masses, you know. Mm. If it weren't for those serendipitous moments, this this auntie suddenly overhearing somebody saying, this guy suddenly meeting my eyes, right? Then Nur Isa wouldn't have won. I wouldn't have won. So when you think about it in those terms, wow! It's it's so, gosh, it, is is it so 
is change, is is choice. So, whimsical? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. I think there is an underlying logic. I think there is a heuristic, there's a decision-making process behind all of that. It's just that we don't know how it's done. Right. And and that, to me, is the wonder of the human mind. Dang. Phew. Wow, she's so 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 deep. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, this is a podcast that you listen to before you go to bed, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, what about the uh, PH and Muda tie up for G15? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Like, uh, what's going on right now? I understand that like, you know, when we were, I was talking to my producer yesterday, and it's like, hey, aren't they like already working together? So it gets a little bit confusing uh, at some point. Where uh, don't we have Muda and PK, you know, working under the Har Harapan umbrella? And then one minute we said that no, I don't think everything is kind of like uh, set in stone or cemented yet. So what's what's the update on outcome with that? Yeah. So all of the seat negotiation is done. Mm -hmm. So Muda will be contesting six seats. Okay. Uh, in these elections. And we will be teaming up. So it is an electoral pact. Uh, we can't admit Muda at this point because uh, it, it's all dependent on ROS. Right. And you don't want to rely on ROS this late in the day because then they will just say, at the very end, suddenly a day before election, said, yes, you are admitted. Oh. And, then, and then you'll be in, a, in a, bit of a, a, a bit of a tough spot. So we've decided, okay, at this point, don't go through that process because it will be too open to all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We'll just have an electoral pact. Right. And we'll sort things out after the elections. Um, and Muda has also uh, agreed to um, Anwar Ibrahim as candidate for prime minister. Mm -hmm. And they have an option to use their flag, their logo. Right. So they will likely use their logo in, in the six constituencies. But our machinery will help them in, in elections. And their machinery will assist us. Uh, in fact, um, I, ha I will, inshallah, on nomination day, have one of the anti-brigades. Anti-brigades. Um, from Muda mm -hmm. um, to be my one of my proposers. Oh. So so it, it just goes to show that you know um, that there's this there's this you know I suppose this is good faith lah between faith, between, faith, between you know? both parties. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah yeah so so it's it's going well I think um, and when we launched our manifesto our our action plan for GE15, uh, Said Sadiq Amira um, the top leadership of Muda was there. Yeah. Um, previously a lot of the uh, brouhaha often revolved around seats. Yes. And seats and seat negotiation is the most tumultuous period apart from selection of candidates. Okay. Yeah. And this is this is where, you know, your hair turns grey very fast <laughs> because it's about getting the right people in, it's getting in the right seats. And it's it's a very tough ask for any leader of of, of uh, party. So so Thankfully, Alhamdulillah, all of that is done. Mm -hmm. And now we look forward to going into GE15. Right. Okay. What, what are your thoughts on uh, the, the youth politics in Muda? Um, okay, so we all know Said Sadiq and her team. I, we say, I know Cheguru Guru Haya, but uh, there was this little hoo-ha about this particular candidate. The thing is, I don't even remember his name, but I know what everybody was talking about on Twitter. The fact that he was previously once a BN supporter and tweeted about racial... Uh, tweeted racial, well, I won't say racial, allegedly tweeted uh, like, you know, some comments talking about how he was in support with... Uh, uh, the previous regime, which was Najib, and all of a sudden he's here in Buddha, and people be like, "Oh wow, look at that!" You know, it's a person just jumping over to the other ship. How can yeah. we trust that? So like, yeah. like this happens in politics, but you know, the thing is, should we give people like that a chance? That's what everybody was actually. Uh, was it a really young guy? He, I can't like remember his name, but the thing is, I remember what everybody's talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, I think he's Tanjong Pi. I can't remember. No, 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 not Tanjong Pi. It's another one. I think it's like uh, Kapala Batas. Kapala Batas. Uh, yes, Daniel. Kapala. Daniel, Daniel yes, Daniel. So. Yes, Daniel. Yeah. Um, I think I think with with things like that, people will always dredge up all sorts of things that you've said before. That's that's the thing about social media. Yeah. Anything that you post online will re remain forever online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and there's no escaping that. And even if you try to, then it's going to be the Streisand effect. Right. The more you suppress, the more people will know about it. And um, I think I think uh, how uh, like for me, you know, I come from a, a reformist party. Yes. And and it's about acknowledging that people have made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that's how, for a while, I tried to process working together with Mahade. You know, perhaps he has repented, perhaps, you know, and, and in good faith at that time, we saw what we needed to do and how we needed to get to Pujajaya. This time around, I think we've learned from that. And it's always, it's always okay, I feel, to give somebody a chance if they want to redeem themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if he's really supported BN, then he could be a BN candidate, but he's not. Okay. You know, the fact that he took a chance and joined another party, um, to me, that in and of itself speaks, says something about how he's trying to perhaps atone for what he mm. said before. 
I mean, I look at it that way. Okay. It's, it's, it's called um, in in Islamic, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, the way we we you know Muslims look at it. It's husnuzon, bersangka mm-hmm. baik. You 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 look at it in in you know bona fide in good faith, yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you accept them one hundred percent. That's okay. why uh, some measure of skepticism, some you know, kind of like a questioning nature of, or that that should always be there, you know. And and uh, what I have learned is, especially after Mahade, is it's okay to to try and build some kind of working relationship, but. You can forgive, but never forget. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't. But doesn't that put like you know Muda in kind of like a tough spot? But before they even feel this guy, the people are already attacking him, and they're kind of like. Well, it's better they attack him now than on on nomination day. Mm, okay. You know, then then he has some room, and this is where I think it's. Uh, I mean the the choices made by political parties. Um, to be honest, I was very surprised that election commission gave us so much time. I thought that they were going to announce uh, nomination day a week earlier. Okay. Mm. Instead, it is it's on on the fifth of November, and uh, polling day on the nineteenth. Mm-hmm. So that gave a lot of political parties time to deal with internal things. Okay. Get things sorted. And to me, if people want to attack people like you know Said Sadiq or Daniel or, mm-hmm. or anybody else, the attacks come now. And then that means we have more time to clear up mm-hmm. and re-establish our own respective narratives and march to Putrajaya. Isn't it sad? Like you know, most politicians at the spend most of their time trying to basically put their narrative straight. <laughs> right? I mean, that's well, that's pretty much how it is, like. Yeah, I know. It's so yeah, sad, right? Just wants to pull you we, down. We, we, we all have reputations. We all have yeah. backstory. You know, like everyone, everyone will have some kind of bias towards. Yeah. And that's just that's just human nature. It's haters, like, haters gonna hate, lah. No matter which party you are, like, Straight away the fellow feel already. Attack, 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 attack. attack. Okay, he, he finish attack already. No more email. Okay, what's your solution? <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I'll talk about education. Would you send your kids to? No, I'm not, not going to discriminate any forms of education. The reason why I'm going to ask, okay, let me give a bit of backstory why I'm going to ask this question over here. I feel like the education system has not changed. I asked this to Syed Sadiq as well. Um, when I was in high school, when I was in primary school and high school, and I basically uh, grew up, and now, and I'm looking at the education system now, it's there's no progress at all from since when I was in school. Yeah. And, you know, Honestly speaking, would you send your kids to a government school today or if you could afford it, send them to a hundred, a more premium uh, school that basically provides better education that's in line with world, like, you know, the world system, like, you know, like Singaporean education. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I grew up at a time, I, I went to SKBD, yeah. SK Bukit Amansara, and Nur Iza was a year my senior. Mm-hmm. And at that time, you know, SKBD wasn't a fancy school. It was just a normal government school. And it was after my younger brother, he's three years younger than me, um, when he finished Standard 6, then they, they became the number one school in the country. Mm-hmm. And then from that time on, like it became the focal point of whether it's ministers or captains of industry, people wanted to put their kids there. Yep. Um, in my, my son, uh, I've got a nine-year-old son. So when he was in Standard 1, I sent him to that school. Right, okay. Right, And and partly it was nostalgia. You know, I went to that school. I want You my will follow your father's footsteps. <laughs> yes, you know, you, you go to my, my alma mater kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But then something happened. The, the school system was so different from how I remember it to be. And uh, when, when we were in government, we were treated so differently. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this, is, this is the thing that, that, you know, shocks me till today. Um, when when people found out that I am who I was, uh, you know, on the side of government, there was like all these letters that came in, like, hey, help, can you help sponsor this? Can you help sponsor that? Oh, wow. And then once Charity Move happened, you know, I, I remember I was, <laughs> they actually invited me to officiate their sports day okay. of, of the school. And and uh, and that was in January and, and it was supposed to be in March. And then Sheraton Move happened at the end of February. And then suddenly that invitation was rescinded. Uh. They withdrew that invitation. Wow. And then I said, no, it's fine. You know, I, I'll, you know, my son is here. I'll, I'll still go. And then um, a couple of things happened in succession. There was the pandemic mm-hmm. and lockdowns and everybody had to learn online. And we felt that, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, at that time, Razi Jidin is the, was the education minister. I think he's probably one of the worst education ministers we've ever had. I am, I am absolutely biased because just a week before Sheraton moved, Razi Jidin was right next to me and, and we had a sec, PH secretary, 
sec- secretariat meeting and he asked this this question which made me like ah, I should have known he had this you know he was going to do this he asked what is the point of the majlis tu sa pakatan harapan and and then i was like dude we have been doing this since 2018 why are you asking this question now i should have smelt it you know at that time so anyway i digress <laughs> razi jidin is probably the worst the worst education minister we've ever had bana <laughs> <laughs> so okay okay right so ah <laughs> <laughs> oh god help putrajaya okay so he's contesting in putrajaya right? ah. okay um but uh, at that time it was so haphazard um and and you know i remember my son saying he had to go for a uh, class bahasa arab and it had 100 kids online oh wow. and, and my son when we obviously we, we you know we can't speak arabic yeah. you know i mean apart from certain islamic you know phrases and and stuff but you know my son was struggling at that time um on top of that when uh uh the sabah state election happened yeah. in in september mm-hmm. i i i didn't go i i went once before it started and then i i, I sent my team my team came back and if you remember at that time the vaccines hadn't rolled out yet yeah. so yeah. everybody was really antsy about people yeah. getting getting out in public uh, yeah getting getting covid at that time and one of my staff um tested positive when he came back um and and then i announced on facebook that you know one of my staff um got tested uh, tested positive so we're all in quarantine so yeah. my, my entire office and uh, when i posted that that same day so i posted must have been like nine o'clock in the morning that same day uh the school uh you know someone sent for my son someone called my wife and said can you please pick up your son and then i was like what and and when my son left the school he was crying in the car oh because he said people w- people said i had covid mm. and he didn't know what that meant he was standard one okay and Ooh. and and it was Then after that, the school sent out a circular, not referencing me by name, but I was the only one who you know mentioned anything about Sabah in on social media. So they said, if you have, if you or your family member uh, are uh, uh, going to Sabah for the Sabah state elections, please don't send your children to school. I was shocked. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, are you targeting me? Yeah. So I I was and my wife cried. And and my son was you know not going to school, so we felt targeted. Okay, we felt targeted. Singled out, uh, singled out, yeah. and and because now previously please come and officiate now please don't come. Okay, you know at yeah. all. So that kind of culture, which during Pakatan Harapan time, did the did the administration uh, administration change when the government changed that score? It remained the same. The attitude changed. Okay, so when Pakatan Harapan was in power, we allowed. You know, okay. Anyone wants to come in, please come in. You know, as long as you don't talk politics. But okay. if you're coming to service, you know, children, the the community, you know, uh, please do. You know, mm-hmm. don't 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 bar people from from coming in. Um, but that all of that changed. You know, it reverted to that BN time mm-hmm. where, you know, if if you're if you're part of the opposition, you're you're targeted. Oh, okay. So so I I felt you know I I can't I can't. You know, my wife is. You know, she's she's super sad. My son is super sad. I can't, as a father, not do anything. So I took my kid out. Mm-hmm. You know, I say, like, and and it's not because I don't love the school. I I went to that school. You know, I want to believe in that school. I want to believe in in that that uh, sekolah kebangsaan system. I am a product of that sekolah kebangsaan system. But the people who lead have failed the children have failed the system they made sure the system is, is what it is right now mm-hmm. so if you want to have a better system you better make sure you vote for the right people you know that that to me that's the biggest learning people make fun of mazli male and saying that he you know oh, oh he's best remembered for black shoes or whatever yeah. it was but he took time to listen to people like chiku fadli mm-hmm. you know if you remember there was a huge uproar right He took time. About the is it the math? The math was too hard for. Uh, um, no, he he was you know like like teachers were complaining about uh, books being too heavy. Ah yes yes yeah. yes. The syllabus, mm-hmm. you know, the additional work that they had to do, 
Masli was listening to that and he was trying to make those changes. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and but and he got like ho- horrible <laughs> backlash. I'm not sure why yeah. he got the horrible backlash. No, I, I think a lot of it was was manipulated, not manipulated lah. I think uh, a lot of it is is um, we learn now that one of the biggest, most critical ministries to to look after is actually uh, penerangan. Okay, is actually communication. Right. So whoever forms government, you know, if Pakatan Harapan were to form the next federal government, uh, whatever form it may take. What's important is to make sure that uh, the person in charge of the Ministry of Communication yeah. is the right person so that we can really set the narrative straight and not constantly be uh, on the back foot and having to respond. Right. I mean, a lot of things that happen, you know, uh, whether it's about ICERT, etc., etc., was really because there was no coordination. Pakatan Harapan rarely met mm-hmm. as a political entity. You know, it was just the cabinet and we would hear outside, you know, after things were announced. So, even as, at that time, the communications director for PKR, you know, and a member of the secretariat, you know, we, I had little control over what was going on. And that was absolutely frustrating. So, then I realised there were fifth columnists. There were um, people who were agents provocateur, you know, people who were trying to sabotage and bring the party down from within. And also, uh, do you think uh, do you think keyboard warriors? Oh, what do they call these people again? Keyboard warriors? Uh? No, 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 no. There's another word cyber. for it. Oh, cyber, cyber, cyber troopers. troopers. Cyber troopers. Is it a real yeah. thing? Yeah, it is. So last night I was doing a TikTok live and I had a, a friend help uh, moderate, and then he said there were there, there were people now. So they've 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 kind of shifted. Uh, now, now they occupy two spaces uh, mm. for 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 Citros. It's cyber troopers. It's uh, Facebook Live and and Facebook and also TikTok. So for TikTok he noticed that there were people coming in, commenting, and then he had to remove them. So there right. was like, Nasi Lemak 1, Nasi Lemak 1, 2, Nasi Lemak 1, 2, 3. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's obviously the same Random person. anonymous yeah. account. Yeah, 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 you know. And, and, and so so it's real. It's okay. it's there. Um, and and it's it's really, you know. It's is it a necessity for any... Pa- I'm, I'm, I know I'm asking quite a very weird question of it. Is it a necessity for any party to have cyber troopers to basically set the narrative straight? Is it no. a part of a strategy? No, I mean... If you want to use influencers, that's that's fine. But if you want to use troll farms, you want to use you know like like this kind of uh, an online army of commenters to, just to skew the narrative to mm-hmm. your in your favor, uh, I think that is that is undermining um, those media platforms as well. Yep. I mean that was the whole argument you know with Elon Musk for example, and when Meta had this uh, um, um, security review yep. right that came out a couple of months ago and said that. <laughs> the Malaysian police had a troll farm and they had to come out and say, no, 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 we don't have one. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, absolute, uh, you know, uh, plausible deniability. But but the point is, some people do that. Um, we don't because, you know, largely, one, because we don't have the money mm-hmm. and two, we don't believe in that. Like, you know, if, if you if you believe in our narrative, then, then, you know, you can share it. But why should we manufacture consent in that way? Mm-hmm. Because then you're you're faking. It's like saying, you know, my brand of soap is better, that brand of soap is really bad, and then you have people coming in like fake buying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Getting people like, yeah, yeah, that soap, yeah. But actually, it's really crappy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, what are your thoughts on uh, vernacular schools? You know, in Harapan GE15, recognizing UEC schools is one of the action plans under education reforms. All right. Uh, could you share with us what was the rationale behind the decision? Yeah, I think, I think it's something that is a carryover from GE14. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people want uh, that kind of recognition. I think um, it is something that could have been done. But it's also something that has to be explained properly because it's one of those things that um, extremists, you know, it's it's a it's a piñata for them, mm-hmm. right? And and it's about disarming. It's about saying, telling people what it is and what it's not. Um, it's like I said, you know, they were running with that narrative. And, and it's really interesting because today, the people who are championing ISID at that time, Waita Murti and Saifuddin Abdullah, are all in the opposite camp. You know, <laughs> Zaid Hamidi, at one point, he said, Langkah dulu, mayat Ali Amno sebelum luluskan. And then he was me, 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 memeluk, bukan mayat Waita Murti lah, mayat politik. Kan? But, but he was hugging Waita Murti. That, that shows to me a supreme example of not only irony, but hypocrisy. But when it comes to things like UEC, when it comes to things like AUKU, for example, we have to explain what it is. What What is it that we're trying to do? Mm-hmm. That's Sorry, why uh, to- uh, stupid question here. But it's not so stupid. What's UEC? UC, UC, U- UEC. U- UEC. So it's it's the uh, examination certificate. Ah, yeah. so it's yeah. like our so it's, it's SPM. Like for, for, yeah, but for, for certain Chinese schools. 
Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, okay, it's recognizing okay. that, yeah, that, yeah. that the certificate. Um, but I mean, what, what we were planning last time, uh, if I remember correctly, it's also making sure that anyone who, who does want to join civil service or wants to go to uh, public universities with a U UEC, they, they, they still need to get a, 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 you know, kind of good grades for BM, for mm. example. They, they do need that. The worry among extremists is that, um, you know, you're, you're creating a completely siloed community, mm. which is not at all the case. And it's, it's actually a straw man argument. And it's 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 to showcase their so-called um, how do you say uh, ketuanan melayu yeah. kind of uh, and it's an extremist form of um, racialism. Yeah, it's, it's quite it's quite chauvinistic. It's quite uh, uh, somewhat parochial and misogynistic. Big words, I know, but uh, it, 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 it to me that is how I would describe calls against you know if you have disagreements, come and talk. Right, don't. Don't label people mm -hmm. with one blanket stroke, and then you are completely denying um, an entire community. Okay, I, I actually went to a vernacular school when I was in primary school, um, but I I do have to say that it is very much like I went to a Chinese school, and literally it's like ninety five percent Chinese. So is there a way where we can really like introduce more? Like how do how do I, how do I put it uh? have a better ratio of, of all our different cultures and identities in Malaysia in but still maintain a vernacular curriculum. Yeah, one of the reasons why I wanted to send my son to SKBD when he went in, like um, his class was very mixed. Yeah. Right? And and for a government school, um, it was very mixed. And that was... I think it was during our generation. Yeah, all government schools is very mixed one. Yeah. Yeah. And, I think and it depends on locality also. Yeah, yes, yeah, true. Yeah. It's true. Yes, it's true. But... People are, sometimes they feel okay. Th th there's both push and pull, la. So mm. like like in my case, for example, because of politics, I had to take my son out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that was a pressure. But for some people, they they also feel that you know that there's certain societal pressures there. Uh, I think we have to address both push and pull. So uh, like one of my staff, um, in 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 my office, um, Malay Malay family, mm -hmm. he sends most of his kids to Chinese school. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and yeah. and I asked him why. No, you know, I want to make sure my kids have a really good education. Mm -hmm. So it's not about Chinese nurse. Yeah, it's, not it's about, about Chinese, the education, yeah. education system. system. Right. So I know quite a number of people who send their kids to Chinese school, and and um, um, this this to me says a lot more. It's not about what you think it is. It's actually about something deeper. It's about the system. Yeah. So it, what we need to do is not address the symptoms, but we need to address the system. Yeah. But so is there a way? Because now you said, uh, I think that's like you mentioned, there's a lot of push pushback from sending, especially if you're a Malay parent or what. Send my kid to Chinese school. Why I'm Malay? Why I want to go to Chinese school? But we do recognize that there's something they're doing differently. Right. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say right, like differently, like you know, right and wrong is very is subjective. But it's something they're doing differently in Chinese school. I've seen it. I've been there, and if it, it really, I would say it, it's a good thing they're doing. But is there a way we can take? What they are doing and apply it to other schools, so yeah, you absolutely. you abolish this whole need of like only vernacular Chinese schools. This is this is why that 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 teacher Chigo Fadli, mm -hmm. you know, who who was threatened to be sacked if it weren't for GE fifteen, mm -hmm. he would be sacked yeah. already, and and he chose the best time to talk about the the issues uh, plaguing our education system. He said, you know, he, he was very frank. He said, when you look at Chinese schools and the amount of investment that's put in, the amount of money that's raised, the question about infrastructure, there's no, no problems about that. So kids who go there, you know, are quite comfortable and then they get, you know, they have whiteboards. There are a lot of uh, government schools that still use blackboards. Yeah. And as a teacher in the system, he sees that. He, he sees that it needs to be reformed. So if, I'm not saying that it's it's the outward appearance, right? Yeah. It's, it's also about the attitude. It's about making sure that teachers focus on teaching, not on administration. And this is where I think having a good minister, having a good leader... Uh, to lead that ministry can can have that kind of uh, shift, right? Mm. And and uh, you take someone like Masli Malay, he speaks fluent Chinese, mm. right? I, I, he, he, I didn't know he speaks fluent yeah, Chinese. Yeah, he does. You should get him on the show and, and <laughs> completely talk to him. You can not embarrass him. Banana, 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 yeah. Yeah, go to Chinese school, man. Eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. It's not about speaking Chinese, is it? Right? It's I think about it's the, the discipline. It's, it's a discipline that instilled no, that no. I liked in, in Chinese yeah, it, school. It's about the discipline. It's about, you know, um, understanding 
what are the problems faced by educators? Yeah. It's, it's about uh, knowing what these challenges are. It's about accepting that you don't know everything. Yes. Yeah. Take yeah. time, sit down, listen, and and try to find a way forward. You know, the thing about leaders, getting the wrong leaders, you know, I, I, had, I had someone complain to me about uh, Shahidan Kasim, the former, uh, you know, the outgoing caretaker minister for federal territories. Yeah. There's this guy, you know, like a couple of people come and complain. They said, oh, you know, he, he you, you spend 40 minutes with him. He, he listens to you for like 10, 15 minutes and then he asks you to come and eat and then he talks about other things. He's not li really listening to you. I mean, that, that's, that's one person's experience. But the fact that I remember Masli, when he was Minister of Education, he wasn't afraid to confront people who were opposing him. People mm -hmm. who were paid to, or, you know, like what seemed to be paid, to hackle him. There was this video that, that was circulating on social media when Masli was uh, Minister of Education and he went down to meet people and people were you know, like, there's this group of Mahasiswa, um, university goers, who were like, Turun, Turun, mm -hmm. Masli, Male, Undo, Undo. And he was standing there grinning and like, you know, okay, I want to talk to you. And the guy just kept on going and going and going and he just kept on standing there waiting, you know. That goes to show Masli wants to listen and the, the other person didn't really want to talk. Mm -hmm. So he was he was purposely agitating. That's fine. Mm. That's fine. But if you want to solve the problem, let's sit down. Let's figure it out. And having leaders who are prepared to sit down, acknowledge their own um, limitations, knowing that they don't know, right? And prepared to to find the best minds, the best brains, the best people, the best talent to shift the system and 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 solve these problems. I think that is critical. Pakatan Harapan. I think people can see you, you. You can, you know, you get a sense that people want Masli back, for yeah. example, right? Mm. And and of course, Masli in Sipang Regam will be facing uh, Hasni. Mm -hmm. Hasni used to be the Menteri Besar of uh, Johor. He mm -hmm. was the poster boy for Amno going into uh, the Johor state elections. But you know, like they were pushing him, pushing him, and then at the end, it was somebody else who became prime minister. Uh, <laughs> oops, 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 was, oops, oops, slippage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I meant Menteri Besar of Johor, you know, totally, Ismail Sabri, you are totally the poster boy. <laughs> totally. They, don't, don't, don't believe for a second anything about, you know, you not being Zahid's choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just another follow-up question on education. Uh. So, do you think that the curriculum needs a huge transformation? Because from, from what I, this again, speaking from experience, uh, like we now work in media, mm -hmm. there's nothing in the curriculum right now that can really point us in the direction of of this line of work, uh, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a very limited curriculum. You, either, you do business or you do science. You know, anything outside, art class is just one class. They teach you how to yeah. what, paint a fish, yeah. you know? And, and then you're expected to struggle on your own. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I think because like, you went to Purdue, you, you know, in the States, I'm sure you, you went to college there, you know yeah. that you are required to do like subjects that's completely outside your own field. You're supposed to problem solve yourself, right? It, it, not just problem solve yourself. Like we are required to take subjects that are completely unrelated to our field just because they believe like you, you need a broader, a broader spectrum of, mm -hmm. of education, like, you know? Mm. So I took like, I, I did communications, right? I took a class of history of math and, <laughs> and a class of video game narrative design, you oh, know, like okay. they just I, make you take different, different things just yeah. to really broaden your horizon. I, but I, here it's all single track, you know, there's eight subjects you take for SPM, the nine subjects you take for SPM, that's all. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like uh, when I was doing chemical engineering, one of the courses I took was Buddhism, actually. Yeah. Mm. So so just to just to understand. Yeah, right? yeah. And, uh, and, and that, to me, help me understand the idea of the other, other people, you know, other belief systems and respect and, and you know, that, that, that is a more rounded education, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think, I think um, you know, I, it, it's, I wish we had a better civic education uh, component mm -hmm. so that kids know, for example, what is democracy, you know, about voting. Yeah. You, know, yeah. You, you, you vote for your class monitor, you vote for the head prefect or whatever it is. And then you you figure out what it means to be a taxpayer, how to pay taxes, 
right? I didn't know about paying taxes until one day when I was working. You pay taxes? What taxes? <laughs> <laughs> then somebody, not the company, but some my a friend, my colleague of mine, to sit me down and and register me online. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So stuff like that, basics, right? Should should be there, uh, including uh, I think, you know, uh, I think kids should be exposed to all the kinds of jobs that there are. So like a career day, yeah. so they know. Because right now, even the imagination is that you need a degree. Not entirely so. Yeah. There, there are people who are completely skills-based and mm-hmm. they should go the TVET route. I feel know. there's a, a lot of stigma towards uh, vocational schools. Yeah, no, no. I mean, yeah. if, if you were to look at, say, in Canada, bricklayers, you know, you, you earn a very good living. There are a lot of Malaysians who are, you know, fruit, fruit pickers in Australia, right? <laughs> Ill- illegally or, you know, however, right? But the point is, the point is, um, there, there's so many jobs out there and, 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 um, education shouldn't be seen just as uh, certification. It, it, that, that's not it. Um, one of the biggest learnings I, I had going to Purdue was not my chemical engineering degree, but the idea of lifelong learning. Mm. Yeah. So the idea that you never stop learning. You should never yeah. stop learning until you oh, die. Oh yeah, of course. That's, that's, that's completely true. You should, one should never stop and then feel like their ego is too big to even learn new things. Yeah, so I- inculcating that sense of curiosity in in uh, school, in schools, uh, I think is something which is absolutely necessary. Unfortunately, what people, a lot of people are saying, even this guy, I, I have to quote him again, Chegu Fadli, he says, politicians and politics needs to stay out of education. Mm. Oftentimes you see, oh wow, I want to, the minister wants to announce, there have been how many thousand students have gotten straight A's for SPM? You know, and we have increased the number of, now we have gotten people graduating, blah, 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 but it doesn't, that's not the point of education. It's not, yeah. You know, my, my father-in-law, uh, he's a he's an he's an academic, he's an educationist. He, he was a rector of a of a local um, university college, and he says, you know, a lot of educators feel that, um, you know, schools and universities should not be a uh, factory. You know, we're not churning out uh, people for the workforce. You know, it's about it's about the next generation of Malaysians, right? right? It's about um, making sure that you know the way we look at life, the way we look at society is something which is more than just, you know, very, very limited scope. And it's, it politics, I agree, politics should stay out of education. So even if Masli were to be uh, Minister of Education again, one of the things that he needs to make sure is that um, ministry, uh, mini- the minister and, and politicians don't get involved in mm-hmm. curriculum, don't get involved in in a lot of the the, the setting of the that, that kind of... Uh, the thing that needs to be done in, in, in schools. Right. Do you think the current uh, education system is robbing our country of people who are capable of doing a lot of critical thinking? Because like you mentioned, it's it's a factory now and like all the exams is literally hafal and then buta buta vomit out. Especially you think last time it's stupid subjects like moral. Yeah. It's yes. literally like a, to pass it, you have to memorize word for word definasi. And like <sighs> yes and no. Um, I mean, sometimes I look at I look at a school system like I look at uh, Sekolah Memandu. Mm. You know, right, okay, defensive driving. I don't know how, how they teach it now, but when I was learning, right, okay, okay, this is how you drive, but they never teach you how to drift. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, <laughs> for, for obvious reasons, yeah. but what I'm saying is that sometimes you pick up those skills later, right? Yeah. Not, yeah. No, I, I don't, I, I, I can't do that, right? Do donuts and stuff like that. But it's about the basics, but it's also more than that. It's about philosophy. Okay. We don't think about education as philosophy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's about, you know, a worldview. Um, you know, it's about how we should look at our life in relation to others in the community, in mm-hmm. the nation. And and how is it that in terms of knowledge, how are we contributing to the development of that field of knowledge? You know, if if you're so so inclined and so interested. Um so I think I think um we have a lot to do. And five years won't cut it, even if Pakatan Harapan were, be, you know, were to be back in power. Uh, it has to be a generational shift. And today, I don't know, I can't imagine how my, I've, I've got a nine-year-old and a three-year-old. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine what that Malaysia is like by the time my three-year-old finishes from five. Mm-hmm. right? But w- when I was voted in in 2018, a commitment I made at that time without knowing Sheraton Move was going to happen was by the time my son, who at that time was in Senate 1, mm-hmm. reaches university going age, I want him to be proud and 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 to be prepared and, and to be accepted in a university like University Malaya. Right. So a long time ago, 
there was only one university. Yep. UM. UM. Yeah. Both my parents went there. Anwar went there. Rosmah went there. <laughs> Ismail Sabri went there. Tunku Maimun went there. Azha, Azizan Harun went there. So many people went there. I didn't. So not because I wasn't proud, but I felt that things changed. Mm-hmm. You know, the glory years of university life in in M- Malaysia was the 60s and 70s, not because of the miniskirts or what what have you, right? Mm-hmm. The social life, but it was the openness. It was the the academic freedom. Ah, uh. do you know how students were agitating at that time? Not you know, some of it was like, you know, not really random things lah. But they were so empowered. The student union at that time ran uh, its own cafeteria had had its they were running its own campus bus routes wow and and they were a force to be reckoned with mm. um a political force not a partisan force but a political force so they were fighting for uh, uh, uh the the downtrodden um uh, upper uh, the 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 people who are hungry in baling the rubber tappers in baling they were fighting for uh, squatters you know and and then they were arrested and that was one of the reasons why auku was was created in 1974 because mm. they were so effective as a political force to demand for change in society that they were seeing that the political establishment became fearful who was the education minister at that time who passed auku mahade but man <laughs> Okay, this next Seven question. Yeah, this guy is still at it, you know. <laughs> yeah, dude, he's like he's never gonna give up. <laughs> <laughs> he's still at it, man. But oh, okay. man, wow. Well, okay, um, I I spoke about this to Syed uh in in a previous episode, and uh, we talked about how uh there's a brain drain issue in Malaysia where any opportunity for any talented individual to basically look for opportunities elsewhere, they just seize it immediately. How would you solve the brain drain issue that's currently happening in Malaysia? Um, we we need a we need a new government. We need a totally different government. I I remember when um, after the uh, the ninth of May, twenty eighteen, tenth of May, mm-hmm. you know, and and the weeks following that on social media, there were people who were like, yes, I'm coming home. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, there were people who was, who said that, and and you know, one of the main reasons I joined politics, I I joined the party in twenty ten. Before that, I was you know very skeptical. E is like a cult. Like why why I I will help in elections because I I believe in in the candidate. But why would I want to join the party? But then I decided that um, I was I was doing an arts residency. So I, I used to be a, a, a an arts practitioner, and um, as a theatre maker, I participated in a lot of residencies. Residencies is where an organisation hosts you, pays for everything, your per diems, you know, flight, accommodation, everything, and you live. Quite a good life, mm-hmm. right? And and that was the kind of life that I was living. I was in, I was in, um, I was in Lisbon mm. um, on a month long residency with a, a choreographer, and we started asking as part of our work this question: At what point will you stop making art? Mm-hmm. And for him, it was if he wanted to have a family in Europe, you can't have a family and make art because it doesn't pay as much. Right. And for me, I felt uh, I told him. My answer was: If something were to happen to my audience, then I will stop. Um, or, or something were to happen to my country, mm-hmm. um, so I would stop making art and do something. Mm-hmm. And at that time, it was uh, 2008, and we felt this this you know like change. And then 2010, and uh, there were reverses in Pera. You know, there was like uh, tumult and and change of government. Then, mm-hmm. uh, and I felt that people, after they saw a glimpse of hope. Lost hope, and then I decided at that point when I was answering this question, it was actually answering a deep-seated question I had in me, that it was time I stopped um, being a bystander, and it was time I uh, joined the fight. I entered the fray, uh, and I joined the party. Mm-hmm. Um, I never, I never wanted to be a candidate, but I, I wanted to come into politics to. Help change the country, fundamentally, so that my friends will come home. Mm. Uh, a lot of my friends, you know, moved overseas, living in Los Angeles, you know, um, New York, London, Sydney, mm-hmm. and and there was a sense that you know when when I make my works, a lot of my works I make for my friends. This is this is a story that's relevant to them, you know. But many of my friends had had left the country, so I. Why would I create any more work? So for me to create work, I want to save the country so that my friends come home, mm-hmm. so that 
Malaysians overseas will feel that yes, you know, this is our kampung, this is our, this is our home. We are proud of it, and we will come home. So, to me, that can happen, um, and it's not just rhetoric. I think fundamentally, it's about eradicating corruption. Yeah, it's about resetting the political system. It's it's fixing a lot of these broken systems. Um, the way I describe it is, in 2018, we were all given a contract. Mm-hmm. We fought for the contract, we bid for it, <laughs> and then <laughs> during that bidding process, we won. We won that contract to look after this house called Malaysia. Yep. When we came in, we started lo- inspecting the pipes, looking at the wiring, at the roof, at the, at the kitchen, and found all these problems, right? Uh, Felda, Tabung Haji, Tabung Angkatan Tentera, uh, LCS, and a whole bunch of things. All of these things were so problematic. Mm-hmm. And then everyone started working on different parts of the house. Little did we know, at that time, people who were working on the roof also allowed room so that people can tebo atap and come in. <laughs> <laughs> people who were working in the kitchen, in the back, also left the door ajar so that orang boleh masuk from belakang. Mm-hmm. You know, masuk mm-hmm. pintu belakang. Right? <laughs> and then they came I love in. this. <laughs> they came in and they kicked us out. And we were like, Look, we have the plans, the wiring, you need to change this, the pipes you have to replace. And then the roof, when we replace it, it's not just about, you know, uh, atap rembia, atap, atap, you know, whatever, right? But we, we need solar panels, this kind of thing. So, you know, we had all these plans laid out and we were beginning to replace things. Mm-hmm. We were starting and, and, and then suddenly we were kicked out. So it's, it's, to me, absolutely unfair. Like, guys, we got the contract. Why are you stealing? Why are you stealing our job? You know, and and I can understand why people would say, "Why would I want to go back to that house?" Yeah, you know, because they, the the comments are coming that you know you were given twenty two months to make a change and you did you guys did nothing. Yeah, but I think people also need to realize like to make changes, right? Especially in such a scale, right? Twenty two months is is not a lot of time, like in, in the grand scale of things. You know, like you you look at. Even but, but it was enough time to change the mind of an Amno warlord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The amount for, of shade that's been thrown in the show today is lasting so phenomenal. Change, uh, for wow. lasting change. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I want to uh, narrow into this one. Uh, another manifesto, uh, I think you guys talked about, oh, you guys released Harapan's manifesto, development of national creative and culture industry. Um, could you elaborate more on what uh, actions that will be taken for this point if Harapan wins this election? Okay, as, as somebody from, from the industry, um, one of the biggest challenges actually we face is different disciplines in the arts. Uh, so you know, for example, there are like six major ones, right? So there's literature, performing arts, you know, uh, you have theatre, dance, you've got uh, visual arts, uh, music, and filmmaking, mm-hmm. right? And uh, film is under communication. Yep. But most of the others is under MOTEC, Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, with the exception for literature, where books are, you know, it's the purview of the Ministry of Education because they want to buy books, you know, Sastra Wanagara, this kind of mm. thing, for schools. So there has to be some coordination there. So that that at that policy making level, that has to happen. Secondly, um, one of the major problems that that we have seen based on conversations with Hans Isaac, who used to run Finas. Yeah. And, and, and some of the others who, who've come in is that um, uh, there's not enough funding, insufficient funding. Arts making is not, uh, is not profit making. Mm. And when I say that, yes, you know, when we think about music, it's both Billie Eilish as well as, um, you know, Ghazal player, Rabab player, yeah. Rabana player, mm-hmm. right? And that, that's music too. So we've got to differentiate between, you know, so-called commercial enterprises um, is, is, is a thin gray line, right? But it's it's important to have that uh, distinction. And um, I think the way Singapore does it, to some extent, is quite admirable. Mm-hmm. A lot of Malaysian theatre performers perform in Singapore. Yeah. Because there, they are paid well, because they are supported by... They're, even, they're even funded, they're given grants. Yeah. Yes, and, and there is a corpus fund. Uh, they have an arts council. Yeah. Uh, and that way, yes, it's, it's, still, it's still difficult for them to get funding, um, <clears throat> they still have to do fundraisers and stuff like that, but um, it's still doable and you can live. You can live a relatively comfortable life as an actor. Yes, you work two, three jobs at one go, um, but it's still something doable. In Malaysia, you've got to you know have a stable, steady income mm-hmm. and then at night go for rehearsals. Not so in Singapore, 
right? So, so I think uh, that model perhaps could be one way that we could look at uh, moving towards. Um, but at the same time, there have been challenges, especially when it comes to uh, traditional art forms. So, mm-hmm. Wayang Kulit, Mak Yong, mm. Menora, Main Petri, DK Barat. Uh, for a long time in, in Kelantan, there was, uh, they were seen as the black sheep uh, in Kelantan because mm-hmm. of the kind of Islamic fundamentalism that's, that's carried by PAS. So, they allow Wayang Kulit, but without a lot of the so-called original nature of Wayang Kulit, okay. which, which has its roots in in uh, um, you know mysticism some animism kind of thing but then then you you want to have a halal version <laughs> of, of wayang which you know you you've got to accept it for what it is yeah. right it's like uh, uh, if you were to watch you know bharatanatyam for example right um tr- classical indian dance yeah. right yes yes they are they do reference Hindu gods, but it's not literal in that sense. You know, it is, it is. It, it, these are forms perpetuated over centuries. Yeah. You, who are you to dictate to them? You know, the the mastery of their craft and and the 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 history and the pride that they have in how long you know the art form has been there longer than nations. Yeah. Right. So it's a story they've been telling for, for, for centuries. Yeah. It's like you just so, can't just change Romeo and Juliet to yeah. something that it's not. Although we have had um, Malaysian versions of that called Romeo and Julie. But which, which is <laughs> which was which is an adaptation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's homage, is an yeah, homage. homage. Yeah. So so uh, w- w- I think for me uh, we've got to have a target, kind of like a Singapore model or a UK model. Or, or even a Thailand model or even a Korean model. Uh, yeah. I think the Korean is a great model. They, the way they export their culture. Yeah. They've yeah. been doing it for like the past couple of decades and look where it got them now in terms yeah. of like culturally. I feel in Malaysia, there are a lot of creative people, mm. uh, very skillfully, uh, perform, perform, performance-wise skill set and everything like that. But yeah. the, any opportunity to get to use that overseas, they'll just go away. And because, only because they'll say that, oh, I don't think I can uh, exercise my skill set in my own country because I don't get that much support. Absolutely. I think we have one of the most talented um, uh, film producers and... Uh, uh, Vis- visual effects even yeah. visual yeah, effects. a lot a yeah. sound mixer for that Disney Encanto is look man Marvel movies a lot of Malaysians work on it, work on it. yeah, yeah. Pixar, even even Pixar vis- animations vis- we, ed- we interviewed mean, a Malaysian girl yeah. there's, 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 there should be nothing stopping Malaysians from going overseas yeah right I mean is, is, we're not like South, we're not like North Korea like no <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no 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 stop <laughs> or even if you come back give us all your money no <laughs> no no not, not like that but at the same time it's about understanding the talent that's here and ensuring that the system enables the talent to fully realize their potential. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is, firstly, it's a mindset thing. You've got to pick the right minister, you've got to re- pick the right people in the team that understands this so that they can serve that community and make sure the industry as a whole um, can, can kind of like grow. There, there are people who will argue that we don't really have an arts industry, we don't really have a creative industry in that yeah. sense. You know, you can't, speak about industry without referencing hundreds of millions of ringgit yeah. right for example maybe the scale of the productivity it doesn't is not at a billion ringgit for example i feel there's a lot of limitations la because to be honest all the creative industry people over here are self founded they're not they're not supported yeah I'm think I'm talking mm. about uh, yeah I'm talking about my own experience because like no but not okay, I'm not I'm not I'm not expecting the government to support me to in my creative uh, line of career, I just so happened decided to make a video and boom it became something and then all of a sudden we just we we just became, basically became self sustaining. I think it's the the platform on which these industries rely on and like the ecosystem that it exists in, it's not enough to, it doesn't really help the people in the industry itself la. You get what I mean. I think one of the better ways uh, to show support and to su- and and to help uh, industry creatives actually is through tax uh, tax reduction or tar- not tariffs. Um, uh, what do you call this? Tax exemptions. Yeah. Yeah. So for I agree. F- for for you know like okay for writers you know you get you get what is it a thousand ringgit off if you buy books, mm-hmm. right? And then if you buy paintings, for example, um, and then we have some incentives for filmmakers. Right, um, but it's got to be more than that. I think. Right. Yeah. So that's a baseline. I think we can we can add more to that. I think some kind of. Um, I worry about easy financing. Uh, I worry about um, because I have friends who, you know, like, 
if if you're talking about pure arts or or you know like um, something which is non-commercial, right? Yep. Like an art film. Yeah. It's no way it's going to make money. <laughs> yeah. It is not the the object is is not meant to make money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's it's if it's a form of expression. Yeah. Expression right? education as well. Yeah. yeah. I feel. So so I think you've got to support uh, talent. It's about spotting talent. It's about identifying limitations, uh, shortfalls in the system, and then um, perhaps on some occasions interventions by uh, certain key people. But we've got to also look at the entire system and see how the industry can benefit by uh, a more wider uh, sy- systems-wide policy change. Mm. Right. I, I know my producer is giving me the eye because I know you have time limitation, but I, I, I want to ask one more, <laughs> one more question before we release you. <laughs> <laughs> release the Kraken! <laughs> All right, I know uh, it's election season. What's your hope for Malaysians and uh, Malaysia herself? Um... This is a. This is a. It's ever changing, right? Ever, your whole. No, oh. no, no, no. I, uh, you know, I I don't spend enough time with my kids. Mm-hmm. My wife the other day when I was on the campaign trail texted me and she said we miss you. Oh. You know, and and to me this fight is not about my family. It's not about me. It's about that generation. Mm-hmm. I want an ent- the next generation to be proud to grow up in Malaysia where. They have equal opportunity. They have better access to better education. That uh, the playing field is much more level. That you know they can really realize their potential in whatever field they want to be in, whether it's sports, whether it's uh, business, whether it's the science, you know, um, whether it's academia. But a lot of that takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of change. We understand what the problems are. We see where the shortfalls, you know, where, where where things fall short of our expectations. Uh, and my my hope is that in this election season, give this some thought. Um, corruption has decimated so much every year. Forty to sixty billion ringgit is stolen every year, mm. acknowledged by IMF, acknowledged by Bank Negara. Forty to sixty billion a year is stolen because of corruption. That system cannot continue. We can't go back to that system. It's just not sustainable. We can't afford another 1MDB. At this, at this rate, it will completely destroy Malaysia. We need the best minds. We need the best talent. We need the best people. We need the best leaders. I hope in my a corner of my heart, dalam, you know, di, di satu sudut hati yang, yang kecil ni, yang kerdil ini, <laughs> I hope that we will we will have some kind of change. You know, I, 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 I'm cautiously optimistic. I, you know, I, I'm not even thinking about 20th of November, but we have one last shot. One last shot. And, and there have been people who told me, you know, we've seen everybody, we, we've looked at this party, we've looked at that party. Last time, you know, okay, okay lah, we give Anwar one time. Mm-hmm. Satu kali. So if last time our, our motto was Ini kali lah. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. Anwar, satu kali lah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I, I, I hope, um, my, my wish is for a better Malaysia, yeah. a more just Malaysia, um, uh, a Malaysia that all of us, regardless of our race, regardless of our background, regardless of our class, will be proud to call home and I want Malaysians who are overseas to come home. Yeah. Come home, guys. I want to perform <laughs> for you guys. Leave, leave politics. You know, my hair, I wanted to be black again. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, Fami, thank you so much thank for you taking so your much. time off. Dude. I know it's election season; it's busy, you get a lot of places to be. But um, I think, uh, you know, thank you so much for this conversation. I think like it's really, I enjoy this in-depth conversation of trying to understand the mind of a politician. You know, and of course, coming from a background of arts and stuff, it's kind of nice to have your input and different inputs as well. Um, I think the most important uh, thing that I would like to tell all Malaysians is to basically exercise your right to vote because uh, you may complain a lot and you may be unhappy a lot of things. Your vote will change something. And do not expect everything to change overnight because you see, it's a constant battle, an uphill battle that when everybody works together, I think we'll be able to achieve things. And for my uh, wish for more politicians to basically go down to the grounds to listen to everybody more because I feel that's where the root of the problem is you yeah. need to understand this a little bit more so thank you very much uh, you can stream us on Spotify share this with all your friends remember go out and vote okay 19th of November we'll speak to you guys 
after 19th of November. <laughs> All right. We'll speak to you guys next time.